All right, Bailey, if you want to unshare yours, I can share mine. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Good morning, everyone. Um, let's see if I can make nope. It just wants you to see my tab if I see my presenter view at all, sadly. But, um, my apologies. One moment. Here, Abra, I can go ahead and share um, our beginning slides to give you some time to pull yours up. Perfect. All right. Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today for the Basics 101 Social Determinants of Health, hosted by HCT and Dr. Abra Bigna. My name is Bailey Schroeder. I'm a training manager here at HCT, and I'll be moderating this webinar today. Let me first briefly introduce you to healthcare education and training. <clears throat> HCT's mission is to provide comprehensive program development, education, and training to improve reproductive and sexual health, health outcomes. HCT is an organization of passionate people who are proactive in their belief that access to evidence-based, medically accurate, reproductive, and sexual health education, training, and care is a fundamental right. In order to receive nursing contact hours for this webinar, participants must attend this entire webinar, complete the event evaluation, and submit the nursing contact hours form to kbradford at hct.org. No one with the ability to control content of this activity has a relevant financial relationship to disclose with an ineligible company. Throughout the presentation, we encourage you to send your questions via the chat box. Uh, to submit a question, hover, hover over the main screen, uh, then you can select the blue chat icon. Um, then the chat will um, appear on your screen so you can type in your question. Uh, please just make sure that you send that to all panelists. That ensures that everyone behind the scenes can see your question. Uh, we're gonna hold all questions until the Q&A portion at the end of this presentation, uh, but feel free to send them in. We'll just hold them until, until then. Awesome, so now I would like to introduce you to um, your presenter for today. Uh, Dr. Vigna has over a decade of experience working to advance health equity via direct service, coalition building, and community engaged action research. Trained in human development and family studies, Dr. Vigna received her PhD from the UW Madison of Human Ecology and has expertise in adolescent health, gender and sexuality, health, health equity, uh, contemplative science, and child development. Prior to joining the evaluation research group, Dr. Vigna was a member of the Mobilizing Actions Towards Community Health Unit with, within the Population Health Institute where she uh, supported statewide efforts to advance health equity via training, technical assistance, and community-engaged research. So without further ado, I'll be turning things over to Dr. Vigna. 
Good morning, everyone, and thank you for the introduction, Bailey. I'm excited to be here with you to talk through the social determinants of health. Um, this was billed as a pretty introductory uh, webinar, but I'd love if folks could enter into the chat box any questions they have or aspects, if you know anything about the social determinants of health that you were hoping that we would dig a little deeper in today. Um, that'll just be great and inform uh, what I cover and how I cover it. So I am ready to share my screen, Bailey. All right. So are you able to see just the slides? Woohoo! Um, so unfortunately, I don't see any, I can't see my chat immediately. Bailey, would you be willing to read to me if there's anything coming up in the chat? Any questions people have? Yes, I will do that. There's nothing in there uh, currently. Okay, great. So the learning objectives today is to talk about what we mean by the social determinants of health, how the social determinants of health impact a person's health status, and why it's important to address the social determinants of health. Um, and throughout the, the course of our time together, I am going to highlight a couple of um, examples of how social determinants of health impact maternal and child health in the form of um, maternal and child infant mortality. I know that there are folks on this call that don't um, deal exclusively in infant and maternal uh, mortality. So please do, if you're having trouble um, identifying how this connects to your work, pop in with questions. I would be delighted to have audience engagement. And I also uh, put in a couple of opportunities for folks to do so, starting with what is it that we mean by social determinants of health, the first learning objective. So what I would love to see from um, you all is how do you define health? This is a topic a concept that we refer to. There's a whole industry surrounding it. Um, we worry about it, but in reality, as is the case with most language, we don't all share the same definitions. So please start entering into the chat how you define health. They're still thinking about it. Okay. I mean, so I did try to make this so that we could have some interaction. And I understand that some people are like, webinar, I'm just going to sit here and eat my lunch. Okay, we've got two. Uh, Christina says a feeling of well being, physical, mental, spiritual. And Brittany says a person's well being. All right. Uh, Brandon says an overall state of well-being that an individual maintains and or tries to maintain. Um, lots of overall wellness between all aspects of one's life, physical, mental, uh, and so on. A state of physical, mental, and emotional well-being and overall well-being. Awesome. So I like to start with trying to surface some of our assumptions because no, who amongst us has like a dictionary agreed upon definition of any word. And so, uh, so often when we're working in community or trying to support one another, it's really helpful to um, look more granularly or get some clarity and do we even mean the same things when we're talking about health. And so for the purpose of this presentation and for most, most of the research on the social determinants of health, uh, the World Health Organization has put out there that health is a state of complete physical, social, and mental well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. And this looks a little different from when we go to the doctor, who is typically just looking for the absence of disease and infirmity. And outside of that, they're not often checking in to see how well we're doing. But it's helpful to conceptualize this in order to understand how physical disease and infirmity tends to manifest. It's because we tend to have imbalances in these other resources, physical, spiritual, economic, emotional. When these things are off, what you have in front of you is a picture of um, the different organs that uh, 
are reactive. On the left side, you have the uh, sympathetic nervous system changes, and on the right side of the screen, the parasympathetic nervous changes. So basically how your body moves towards or away from stressors or relaxes around stressors. And when we experience that absence of um, infirmity or disease, as the World Health Organization describes it, we tend to experience thriving, which is really this balance of for the demands that are made on my life, I have sufficient resources such that I'm not in a high level of stress all of the time. And so when we look at um, maternal and child health in particular, that bucket of money and concern, the reason why there is a whole area on maternal and child health is because um, maternal and child mortality rates for the US are surprisingly high in general. And then when you do what's called disaggregate that data but and look at the different um, socially ranked identity groups according to race, we see that they're abhorrently high for black parents and babies, that 15 out of every 1,000 black infants die before their first birthdays. And when we look at some of the aspects that play into health and well-being of um, whether someone's incarcerated, if they own a home, how children are doing, if there's poverty, if there's unemployment, these are just sort of some of the indicators that are available out there through those larger data sets. We said that Wisconsin has, is arranged um, by rank on the key, these key economic measures as one of the worst states in America. So what shapes our health? Enter what comes to mind in the chat. Our environment, you. culture, family, community, nutrition, exercise, relaxation, not to be too general, but everything, role models we have or don't, access to resources, hereditary environment, access where we live, our daily choices, good or bad, relating to food, exercise, et cetera. Yeah, absolutely. All of these factors play a role in what resources we have, which resources we access, what resources we have ability to access, and also some of which is, um, I'm not seeing so much on here, but uh, the stressors that are on us. And so the social determinants of health as a concept is a way to support folks thinking about how all these factors surrounding us impact how our bodies are functioning. And so they're often referred to as the conditions in which we are born, in which we grow and age and work and play. And people will often group them in these like what's buckets. It's, it's such a lovely term that I was introduced to once I entered public health, the buckets of everything. Uh, the buckets of childhood experiences with sort of trauma that you encountered while your nervous system was in the process of forming and um, figuring out how to relate to an environment. Is this an, an environment where I'm, I got to look out for myself, in which case I'm going to be on high alert all the time? Or is this an environment in which there are enough resources and there are others who are also looking out for me, in which case I tend to have a calmer um, autonomic nervous system that uh, manifests in during what's referred to as developmental periods and then is, is my normal across the lifespan. Is the housing clean? Is there lead in the paint? Is there lead in the soil? Is there a lot of pollution that's going to damage my lungs while I'm forming and increase the likelihood of asthma? Is the education system stimulating? Is it appropriate for my needs and for my level of ability? Um, is it punitive because of biases that exist in the uh, minds of the educators towards someone with my skin color or with my sexuality? Social support, access to health service. Is there even health available that I can get to when I have um, a health concern or when my child has a fever? Can I afford the... Um, medicines that can bring that fever down and reduce the likelihood of brain damage happening from a spike of a fever, or do I not have the resources for that? Is there Walgreens nearby? So on and so forth. There's, um, well, before I say that thought, 
This is uh, an image of what the social determinants of health look like nested inside the social ecological model, which is um, a, a frequent model that's used in uh, sexual health in particular um, and sexual violence prevention to try and understand how we are individuals nested in families, nested in households and communities in um, nations in the globe and how we can have an impact on all of these aspects of our nestedness and that they all very much have an impact on us down to the cellular level where we know that certain genes, you could carry them, but they only turn on or off depending upon the environment, such as like schizophrenia, depression, a lot of the mental health um, related genes that we know about. We know some people carry them and don't express that mental health need and other people do and believe that it has to do with the environment. So our final question, how, not our final question, but one of our final objectives is how does the, the social determinants of health impact health status? And the best way that I can describe this is to try to um, root it in the body because it's really through how our bodies function in response to these social determinants of health. So I have an image on the screen now of, um, you know, a lovely Wisconsin rural road. You probably have driven down it or been driven down it. It's a calm day, clear weather. So I want you to just like take a moment and sit with that picture and summon a memory of a time that you were on no traffic, clear weather, open road, big sky, not too bright. And enter in the chat, what does it feel like in your body? I'll say that my body feels very settled and there's a lightness, an excitement, and a calm, happy calm. Yeah. Like it just feels like I could enjoy some speed maybe and feel the wind in my hair and I'm not worried about something going wrong. Like, I just feel there's like a sense of freedom that I feel, or I can go slowly and watch the birds and no one's going to be honking behind me. So this, this freedom. Now, shifting from that sense, we have the experience of being in a different, different environment where we're still on the road, but now that road is covered in um, snow. And imagine this isn't just the morning after, you are actually in the middle of that snow squall, right? So some of the time that you remember, if you have ever driven or if you've been a passenger in a car, where the conditions have seen seemed uh, precarious, like you might actually get hurt, you might actually die. And a lot of this is out of your control because you are just subject to the weather. Yeah, and what does that feel like in your body? Focused, stressed, hate it, tense, on edge. Yeah. How's your breath? How do your shoulders feel? Are they like scrunched up? Are you clenching the wheel? Did you maybe just turn the volume down so that you can concentrate? That's a weird thing that we do, but we do it. <laughs> Yeah. How fast is your heart beating right now? Yeah, so everything that, those two different sensations is the difference between being that first one in the parasympathetic system, which is calm, which is like able to rest, to digest, because there's no immediate threat. Right. And then the, the ladder, the feeling of driving through the snow, that's really 
a sympathetic system activated where our body is like, I might die. We need to fix how, change how we're functioning so that we are ready to respond quickly and immediately and with power and with focus. Like, so your eyes literally dilate when you feel afraid. Your heart is beating faster to get oxygen out to those large muscles. Your, um, your body is literally sending glucose to your quads and to your glutes and to your hamstrings, to your larger muscle groups that are responsible for fight or flight. And it is pulling that blood and you're breathing short quickly to keep pulling oxygen in to supply uh, resources to the muscles. But your body is also stopping digestion at that time because it's prioritizing your immediate um, survival. And so sometimes people get nauseous because whatever food that you've eaten, if you have some in your stomach right now is literally rotting because your body is not in the process of breaking it down because it has prioritized other things. And if you had a tear or a cut, your body is not, is no longer at this moment trying to fix that cut. Um, very slowly, there will be little pieces of time in which your body will begin to reattend to those things. Cause of course, stopping blood from pouring out of your body is very much one of its um, priorities. But in this way, we see how uh, stress over time and being in a, a state of chronic stress, when you live in that state of fear and threat, your body doesn't function as well as it could because it's literally prioritizing all of the resources for your immediate survival and not for your long-term survival. And so these social determinants, whether or not there are street lights when you're walking home from your um, wait staff job late at night, or whether or not you have money or resources to buy or the money to buy resources like books to read your young child or books to go to school, your quality of housing, all of these things, is your housing safe? Or is your housing actually a place where you feel frightened or that is actively harming your health because of the um, mold that's in the space? Is it actually calling upon extra resources from your body just to try and maintain survival? So this chronic toxic stress of having too much demand and not enough resources uh, weathers the body over time. And humans are this like incredibly fascinating creature where, as I said earlier, if you're subject to a lot of stressors during um, developmental windows, that's just your body's like, okay, this is what the world is like. And so even in the absence of the actual real threat, like we can freak ourselves out. And some of us, because of the presence of threat or the absence of protection as children, stay in this like, like a hair's breadth away from being in panic all the time or being freaked out. And this is where a lot of anxiety or sometimes depression when you're just exhausted and your system is like done also emerge from. And so we see how over time, if we stay more in the um, sympathetic nervous system, there's more likely headaches, fatigue, irritability, high blood pressure, stomach aches, weight gains, increased risk of diabetes, digestive problems, low bone density, weakened immune system, premature birth, low birth rate, higher risk of SIDS, higher risk of postpartum depression, all sorts of things that very much impact maternal and child health. And I, I have found this really interesting because for many, many years, the scientific community was all like, well, why do humans give birth to these like totally helpless creatures that are basically just like embryos outside of the body and are really quite a problem. And for the longest time, they thought it was because um, the head of the, of the child, because of our enormous, highly functioning brain, that story that we like to tell ourselves about why we're so special and can treat every other being on earth as less than, because of our wonderful brains um, got so big and yet pelvises didn't get so big. And so it triggered childbirth early. But after a number of really interesting studies about um, pelvis size and baby size and head size that we determined that that's not actually it, but rather that childbirth is typically triggered when the baby's metabolic needs surpass the pregnant person's metabolic needs. So that's basically like in order to keep growing the baby, you have to starve yourself or not take care of yourself. And that's when your body is like, okay, I'm going to die if this parasite stays within me any longer. And so it's like time to get out. 
And it just so happens that because of our size or what have you, it's very early on in the development of our young as compares to elephants who um, gestate for two full years before they wind up giving birth. And that baby is like ready to go. But the size of the, of the parent of that baby elephant is like 200 times the size of the baby, probably more than that. But so when it comes to preterm birth, we see that it's often a reflection of too many stressors on the pregnant person and insufficient resources upsetting the balance too early. So this is the theory behind why we see uh, preterm birth being much higher in um, amongst people that don't have a lot of resources and have historically been denied access to developing wealth or access to social welfare resources. Um, and people that experience a lot of discrimination because of racism and all sorts of other things. And so this is a more uh, detailed explanation about all the specific types of stressors, of determinants of stress that wind up um, influencing the maternal um, hypothalamic pituitary access stress hormones that place, that set into motion the cascade of um, preterm birth. And we have this norm of idea that like our health is mostly our responsibility, right? And I mean, like it's partly our responsibility for sure. And all the industry of health uh, sells the idea that it's all your responsibility. And if you go onto social media, all you will see are people that have chosen to take care of their health and like, bam, they've seen really great um, changes. And they don't as often reflect on um, how they had good options available to them, like time available to work on their health or money available to buy the time to work on their health, so on and so forth. And so this norm of individualism that we have um, in a lot of Western nations, it's particularly strong within the United States, misleads to our understanding of health. We've, we've seen it during the pandemic, this idea that um, it all, you can wear a mask, but I don't have to wear a mask is a misunderstanding that a mask primarily protects other people from you more than it protects you from other people. But I won't go further on that is that is a very, people have very strong opinions about that. But when we've done research about what people think determines our health, primarily uh, like 85% uh, think that 85% of our health rather is influenced by their personal health choices. So what they eat, whether they exercise or whether they smoke. 75% um, of people think that the majority of it has to do with whether a person has health insurance, 70% whether the person has access to affordable health care. But when um, they take a step back and they look at, uh, they statistically model all of these different um, factors that play a role, these social determinants of health, they find that actually the quality of the physical environment, so um, exposure uh, to opportunities for health, for clean air, um, or exposure to, um, you know, environmental contaminants like pollution or uh, social uh, stressors, what have you, play a huge role uh, as do in the social and economic factors, the family's income, the, the employment opportunities, whether there's social support or not, or whether half of the family is incarcerated, if the community is considered a safe space, that this actually is 50% accounts for uh, individual's health and well-being. Clinical care at twenty percent, and um, health behaviors only thirty percent. So you can make all the best health choices, but if you don't have good options, you will likely experience poor health. And it's something that earlier when I talked about how uh, in the United States we have really poor maternal child health outcomes, and if you just look at that on average, it's already upsetting. But then when you look at it more um, based upon these socially ranked identities, you see that these factors play out very differently across socially ranked identities such as race. And moreover, it's important to understand that the social determinants are all connected to each other, that you don't tend to just have access to one and not the others. They tend to come together such that um, it said that not everyone has the same opportunity to be healthy. And there's all sorts of research coming out of California about how your zip code can predict your, the length of your life. 
um, and the quality of your life in terms of diseases or um, morbidity that you're going to experience. And a lot of this has to do with um, uh, social policies that have played a role in determining what communities look like. We know that um, bus stops and parks and schools are not naturally occurring phenomenon, but people in decision-making roles have decided where they will happen and who can have access to them and who cannot have access to them. And we see that how these things are very strongly lumped together in that the good, the good schools that provide um, more of a supportive education and tend to have more resources for uh, children with a variety of learning styles and developmental needs tend to be in the more highly resourced areas that have historically been restricted to people of European descent and specifically excluded intentionally through the development of those neighborhoods and through their administration. Um, and through, uh, you know, I look on next door neighbor app and it, frankly, in the neighborhoods that I'm a part of that are predominantly white, if they see a person of color walk past, it's usually set on the next door neighbor. So even though we don't currently have um, many laws and policies, there's the sort of de facto response of suspicion to like, you don't belong here that plays a role. And so this is just a different way to look. I, I'm showing you like a whole bunch of different um, models for how to understand these abstract ideas uh, that reflects how some of these uh, distributions of power and of resources such as racism dictates, who has social capital, access to good education, access to transportation, employment, food access, what have you, has to winds up playing out in those health outcomes. And so when we look at that, those health factors that 50% that predict half of our health at the least, um, we see that these circumstances, these social economic factors, the physical environment, they are shaped by the distributions of power which drive the allocations of dollars and resources at the global, national, and local level. So a lot of times when people talk about social determinants of health, they just talk about these physical aspects of the conditions and fail to mention that like who gets to make decisions and who's been historically excluded from them is a facet of a social, it is, is a social determinant of health. And it's something that there's been um, an increasing movement towards people both recognizing and engaging with intentionally. So you may have read about like public health 3.0, that was a big component of that article, as well as the World Health Organization has put forth a framework for trying to understand how, what shapes health and well-being. On the far left, they've got some of the social and political context like governance, so police violence and surveillance that it occurs upon its citizens. The macroeconomic policies like the World Bank or the um, International Monetary Fund and how they push um, developing countries to uh, sell resources and to pay their workers very poorly in order to become a player on the national trade seas. Then there's social policies such as that dictate the labor market housing, how land is used. For example, in the state of Wisconsin, um, inclusionary zoning and rent control are both illegal. So those are two major levers that we see in California and New York are often used to try and maintain affordable housing so that if families are poor, they can still afford to live in the area, particularly with the housing crisis that's happening now as everything's going up. But because our legislature had decided that to benefit the people who own the land more than the people who um, rent, those are not uh, levers that are available at this time. And so those, that's an example of a social policy that plays a role. Um, and then you've got the social hierarchy. So that piece of like class as an economic base that provides access to resources, that power is related to the political context, prestige or who's considered honorable, whose opinions matter in a community or who decision makers listen to is another way to look at that. And the actual experience of discriminations, which can be stressors, that all of these will play a role in where we live and in our experience of living there and in our access to resources, which then ultimately impact our health. So a much more simplistic model. I wanted to give you them all so that you can go as 
big or as little as you want is that unhealthy community conditions lead to greater exposures and behaviors, which lead to medical conditions, which ultimately lead to health inequalities. But those unhealthy community conditions are determined by an inequitable distribution of power and resources and power in that the decision making about resources and opportunities such that people have talked about it's powerlessness that is the patterns and who makes decisions and the patterns and who experience ill health are very strongly linked such that many argue that powerlessness is what is causing sickness. And I threw a couple of words out there that people, again, use a lot, but don't all mean the same thing. So I just want to pause for a second because health equity is like, it's, it's a hot, sexy term. Everyone's all about health equity, but they don't all seem to mean the same thing. So health disparity was the term that was used up until like probably about mm, going on, coming up to like 10 years ago that we first start to see health equity start to explode in the public health scene and in the research scene as well. So health disparity is just referring to a population-based difference in health by itself. Disparity does not remotely indicate if there are a chain of events that produce those disparities. So for example, a health disparity is that women have more breast cancer than men do. So cisgender women, cisgender men. And this is just a fact of people who typically are assigned female at birth develop more breast tissue in their lifetimes than people who are assigned male at birth. Also the ratio of estrogen to, to testosterone is such that they are more likely to develop cancer in a larger amount of breast tissue. And so we see a disparity. We just look, there's a population-based difference between assigned female at birth and assigned male at birth people that haven't altered their bodies. Whereas the health inequity is a health disparity that's based on unfair, socially determined circumstances. And because health inequities are socially determined, change is possible. So an example of an inequity is that um, American Indians have higher rates of diabetes than do uh, white Americans. And this is due to the disruption of their way of life and the replacement of traditional foods with unhealthy commodity foods. As the nations that were indigenous to this land had very robust governance and food processes that when colonization began um, and the genocide and displacement occurred, all the folks who lived here before our mighty nation now live on reservations and don't have access to the same rivers and the woods that they have relied upon to feed their themselves and their communities since time immemorial. And instead, um, without access to uh, the subsistence that kept them alive, are being forced to um, live off of, for a long period of time, government provided um, foods, which were high calorie, low nutrient dense foods. Um, and because of poverty, that remains the same. And so you're more likely to experience diabetes when you are consuming primarily high caloric, low nutrient content foods. So health equity is when every person has the opportunity to achieve their full capabilities and potential for health and well-being. And in that example of Native folks, they don't have the same opportunity as uh, folks who are not contending with the intergenerational trauma um, and that don't face the same discrimination that uh, Indigenous folks have been facing since colonization began. And just to clarify the distinct between social justice, which is the absence of unfair, unjust advantage, privilege, disadvantage, or oppression based upon any of our ranked identities. So before I move into talking about like, how do we address the um, health disparities and health inequities, I wanted to share this really great video um, provided by Kummer yes, Jones, who um, is the former president of uh, the American Public Health Association. And I want to make sure
Hey, Abra, it sounds like we can't hear you. We also cannot hear the video. Abra, when you share your screen, there should be um, a little checkbox in the bottom left corner. It looks like we can't hear you still. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Hallelujah. All right, um, so my apologies about that. I will say that, where was I just speaking? All right, so I will share this video separately just in case so I don't eat up more of your time in trying to show you this video. But essentially uh, it's just a metaphor for if we know that some populations experience this ill health. So for example, uh, American Indian folks with diabetes. And think of it as like the ill health is falling off of a cliff. Like at what place, at what moments do we intervene to try to preserve their health and well being or to prevent them from falling off this cliff of good health? And it work, walks through the different um, ways in which we can approach that work um, through this metaphor of the cliff. And that's all that I'll say about that. And I'll go back to sharing my screen. Let's see if it'll still. All right. So I wanted to um, end with some examples of the work to change this that is currently happening um, in Dane County as well as nationally. Uh, so if the focus is changing the conditions that shape health, um, when it comes to maternal and child health, the nurse family par partnership is a beautiful model of saying like, okay, well, people can't access healthcare sometimes because transportation is the issue, because um, even just getting to the doctor, navigating the space, there's will often be a lot of uh, microaggressions that are happening on the way that the person will then have to recover from such that it doesn't even seem worth it to go to the childcare appointments. Um, to be judged about how you're parenting when you're doing the best under the circumstances that you have. So the nurse family partnership is a process by which the nurse actually develops relationship with the recently birthed families and will continue to come to the house to check in and to provide some support to the new parent or parents. The centering pregnancy model is um, a, like a, a pregnancy class that brings in a bunch of people that are all pregnant at the same time and really works to develop the relationships between folks within the room. So that, um, because it's really scary when you're pregnant, there can be a lot of health issues and then also not knowing what comes after. And so tries to cultivate an environment of building some of those social connections with other parents during a time that a lot of individuals experience a lot of isolation. Planned Parenthood is trying to remove the economic barriers for accessing sexual health needs and reproductive health needs. Um, there is a lot of work around consent education to change some of these norms about what it means to say yes to something, um, to be okay with being, and the, the possibility of changing your mind and um, about sexual activity mid cycle or in between times that you're engaging with someone. And then bystander intervention trainings are also ways to try to change the environment around it, social norm campaigns about what it means to be um, a, a person that is masculine of center and defining that more broadly than just you get to be angry or you get to be sexually aggressive, but actually a masculine of center person is really amazing, powerful, and wonderful when they are much more, when they um, embody their full humanity. And then also work to block some of the anti-transgender laws and policies that's happening in Texas and Florida um, to ensure that children who aff affirm genders that are not um, 
aligned with the ones that they were assigned at birth are able to access gender affirming medical care, which we has it has been demonstrated as being a suicide prevention activity. And moreover, it's to ensure that they get to stay with their parents if their parents are trying to prevent um, poor mental health of their children by ensuring that they get gender affirming care in Texas. The whole law is that um, it should be children should be removed from those parents and that that's actually a form of child abuse when what we actually know is that it's the best outcomes come when you can keep children with their parents or with their initial caregivers and make that environment more safe, that tends to turn out better than removing children from that initial environment. And then also there is centering the voices of those that have been most impacted by getting folks that have been historically excluded from deciding where the resources are and how folks access opportunities into the decision-making roles. Um, so these are like the main ways in which people will try to focus on like one aspect of a social, like one social determinant of health um, or a number of social determinants of health. The World Health Organization says that any serious effort to reduce health, health inequities will need to involve changing the distribution of power, empowering individuals and groups to represent strongly and effectively their needs and interests. And in so doing, to challenge and change the unfair and steeply graded distributions of social resources or the conditions of health to which all citizens have claims and rights. So the one organization that I wanted to highlight is the Foundation for Black Women's Wellness operating in Dane County. They've got, um, they did some really amazing uh, research where they went out and spoke with uh, black families to find out about their experiences of child, of maternal and child health um, and, are doing a lot of organizing to try and uh, alter these conditions to reduce the likelihood of, or to reduce the disparities and inequities wherein we see black babies are much more likely to not make it to their first birthday. So that was like the quick run through of what the social determinants of health are, how they affect health, how people change them and probably Many of you are like, huh, we're already doing some of that work. Maybe I just didn't think of it as the social, social determinants of health. Or maybe you're like, yeah, 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 I just needed this credits. I've always thought of it as the social determinants of health. Either way, I would love to see it in the chat right now. What does it look like for you to address the social determinants of health in your clinical practice? And that means like whether or not you operate in a clinic, this just could be in direct service um, in your practice. What is your work to change that? or to address the social determinants of health. Well, looks like maybe nobody's <laughs> addressing the social determinants of health. Oh, wait, no, we got some, we got some. School policy work, beautiful. Our clinic was placed in an area that has trolley access to provide care to more people, amazing. Yeah, I've had other people talk about how um, sometimes in their organizations or clinics, putting up pictures that reflect the diversity of the people that you serve, um, hiring folks reflective of the diversity, getting leaders that look like those that they serve um, is a way to can change that experience. It means a lot to walk into a space and to feel, to see aspects of yourself there or to at least not see, feel different and as though you don't belong when you're particularly vulnerable and in need um, and asking for support in some way. So I have um, a couple of slides of, on best practices in talking about the social determinants of health. Uh, you may have noticed that this is like a relatively jargony sort of an idea, social determinants of health. It just doesn't immediately uh, bring to mind what people are talking about and can be very hard to talk about as a result. 
So inevitably, the um, suggestion is always to use plain language. So food insecurity, very abstract concept, but using it in concrete terms and illustrating what it means when you don't have it. So we, when we don't have enough of the right food, it holds us back. Like I can't do my job, my kid can't learn. There's also been some really interesting research about how to talk about any of these ideas in ways that people understand or don't find as polarizing. And this slide has some um, simple values-driven and emotional compelling statements, like instead of social determinants, our opportunities for better health begin where we live, learn, work, and play. Or where we live, learn, work, and play can have a greater impact on how long and well we live than medical care or all people should have the opportunity to make the choices that allow them to live a long, healthy life, regardless of their income, education, or ethnic background. So those are just some examples of what that can look like. And always being sure to um, get out of like academic brain, which I clearly struggle with code switching out of that, um, and into telling a story. So, creating an image of a situation rather than just saying that more than half of parents live in poor neighborhoods and don't feel safe letting their children play outside. Humans tend to respond more when we have a more of a story of like many parents feel they're not providing their children with the most basic opportunities to play outside, but are unable to move because of their job or income. And then lastly, uh, because everything is polarizing when it comes to change these days, uh, I want to return to that idea of triggering the parasympathetic system, that many of us are living in a pandemic, all of us are living in a pandemic, and, um, and there is just the sense of this invisible threat that we have no control over and that can hurt us or other people that we love, and so most of us are on the edge of threat all of the time. And so any work that you do to try and generate a sense of safety and calm by triggering their parasympathetic system will be a support of um, developing coalition or working together, the relationship needed to work together to change social determinants of health. And the little image that you have on the screen is just a quick follow this and match your um, breath in to its expanse and then exhale to its collapse. And anytime that we slow and focus on our breath, it brings us into the presence and usually the sense of safety that actually exists within us all the time, as opposed to being so focused on unknown threat from outside. And so that's what's often referred to as a nervous system hack. So I wanted to leave the rest of our time open for questions. And I, I will stop sharing because I believe Bailey has a couple of last slides. Yes, I do. Um, it's going to take me a second. It seems to not like me at this moment, but um, as really? I yeah, as I share those, um, feel free to drop any of your questions into chat or use the Q and A feature. Um, those will be sent uh, just to um, uh, us behind the scenes, and then I can read them out for us. So go ahead and send all your questions. All right, we've got no questions yet. Aubrey, can you see the Q&A in the chat? When they do come in? I can see both, yes, thank okay. you. Okay, awesome. So weird to like, oh wait, maybe, can I do it that way? Yep, to be the only person on gallery. I forget anyone else is here and I kind of just want to make faces at myself. So please ask me a question. <laughs> Aubra, we do have an anonymous question I can read to you. Okay. Um, how can we practice talking about social determinants of health 
when others in the organization don't want to practice or care about it? Great question. So this is something where um, it's referred to frequently as, call, as like uh, finding communities of practice or affinity space. Anytime that we're like, hey, status quo of just like assuming that every time I experience ill health, it's an entirely a reflection of my own worthiness for good health by way of my choices or not. Um, maybe talking about how it's not all that uh, is considered, is experienced as threatening. Um, it's helpful to find other people that feel the same way, that share an affinity with you for discussing such things and to be able to problem solve. So those tips that I got about like how to use language in such a way that you're not um, over-intellectualizing it, but, or not over, but bringing it into a more lived experience will help you because essentially whatever, whenever we're working to change things as they are, we need other people to do that, right? And we need other people to see why it matters to them. So in social, in community organizing, it's referred to as finding your shared self-interest. So for example, um, I would like to reduce uh, the opioid epidemic, not because I or anyone in my family is, has, is addicted to opioids, which actually a member of my family is, but um, not because it has like any immediate bearing on my health and well being. Like even my family member's addiction is not going to impact me or the length of my life. However, that family member who has to call upon 911 on the regular to get um, emergency support is draining the taxpayer funds uh, in order to support that, to pay for the time that she is in and out because she doesn't have health care, right? And because she's pulling that drain on whatever Medicaid and county funds that we have, our counties don't have as many funds to support the other people that have chronic health issues. And because of that, those people aren't getting support. Well, like, you know what? They're breaking into my house or they're stealing my neighbor's catalytic converter who now can't get to work or now who can't bring their um, child to health care. And then I'm called upon to help out my neighbor. And because I'm friends with them, I love them. But now this has impacts on my life. Like we can't disentangle our lives and when you pull on one thread over here, it's not immediately clear all the knots that it ran through, but usually a snag starts to begin. And we don't feel it immediately often until it's too late. And so helping people to see those connections and to see how it's in their own best interest, rather than relying um, on these false stories about how it doesn't actually impact us is my sense of where the, the movement is and finding other people that share that desire to bridge those differences in belief that, hey, this doesn't impact me versus it does, to um, practice and to turn to of like, hey, I tried it and this is the response I get, how would you have responded? And just to help it be like fun and pleasurable because otherwise, if all you're doing is talking to people who are mad at you all the time, like you won't wanna keep doing it. And the world needs you to keep doing it. You know, like you need to keep doing it for you and for your kids and for your neighbor's kids and so on and so forth. So finding ways that you can continue to sustain it is, and as humans being in community, we find very pleasurable, <laughs> especially if we try to build community with someone and they reject us to return to people that um, can buoy us and help us to keep going. Um, is from what I have seen and what I've experienced in my life as the key to, to keeping going, to making that change. It looks Great. like we, we have a question in the Q&A. Okay. Um, can you provide more information about the study that has been examining the correlation between zip code and health? What do you recommend to search to learn more about this? Okay, so I recommend literally searching um, your zip code can predict your health and just um, Googling that. And um, I can Google it afterwards. It's out of California, 
Um, and it like hit the news all over the place. I want to say like maybe Kaiser Permanente was one of the funders for it, or I don't, I'm not, it was a while since I've read it, but um, I can follow up with that and send it out through HCET with the link to that um, video that I failed to show. The other question is understanding that access to services is a big part of social determinants of health. What suggestions do you have for short staff clinics or health departments to be able to extend our services further when we are already stretched pretty thin? You know, that is, first of all, thank you very much for your service. I don't think you probably get enough um, true gratitude. And since I very much have seen how the health of people in the Wuhan province already impacts the health of my child and my family members, um, wherever you are, I thank you for your work. Um, so I would say for, since access is bigger than you, like there are, there's a concept called like 15%. Okay. So some of these ideas are like so big and hard. We're just like, oh, I can't even, it would take so much to make this happen. What can I possibly do? Well, we start with like the 15%, you know, like no one, the world doesn't need you to bleed yourself out to fix it. The world needs you to do your part and for you to have rest and for you to feel joy and not to sacrifice yourself. Cause it's like ethic of sacrifice is part of, in my perspective, what has gotten us to this place of everyone feeling so drained that we don't have the energy left over to lean into the different ways in the world that the world has functioned in the past in other societies and the way in which we could function and do in micro ways, but could go on bigger scale. So don't harm yourself for it. And what's the 15% that you can do right now? So you can uh, think about accessibility of the services that you already provide. And um, in terms of how I said before, like having the spaces, do the images, does, does the language use reflect the diversity of um, people that you hope to serve or that are most in need of your services? Does your staff reflect that? And it's not, some, I'm not saying like get rid of staff if they don't, but, um, can we do what we can to develop our capacity to have greater humility and um, greater understanding and respect for the diversity that we don't currently embody so that we are welcoming of it? Can we make that a priority in our um, hiring when there is turnover? Uh, can we take some time to strategically plan? I know you're already stretched thin on top of it, but if you have like a minute, be like, okay, well, how do we advertise? Like, can I, are there certain partners that might know folks that I could say, that I could let them know or send the advertisement to? Um, you likely already do many of these things. And if everything just seems like too much, then rest, then first rest, legit. And then when you, if you're carving out like a little piece of rest, you might just have like a little droplet available to think about strategic planning and then use that energy when you got it and put it to something else. Talk to other people about how they vote um, because who they vote for uh, and that make sure that your representatives support budgets that support services like the clinic. Um, because it does have an impact. We're very afraid of talking to each other about politics. And I think that that's, you know, we know that there are like bots and people that have worked really hard the last five years to make us afraid because they stand to make money if we're afraid to talk to each other and they just get certain people into decision-making roles who decide who gets what resources we get from where and who gets what opportunities. Um, so if, when you can summon the courage to talk to each other about it, in a way that is really like, I care about you, you care about me. And like, can we, do you think that this person cares about you or me or other people and not just us? Because I think if we just care about ourselves, I don't think that's actually the best in our best effort or, um, yeah, it is sticky and hard. 
to ask people to do more with so little. And so perhaps the answer is not to ask people to do more, <laughs> but to ask us to come together and be more than like, you know, the sum of our parts. Or sit with that like 15% and celebrate that. Celebrate still surviving and the people that haven't quit. Got the comment. I think a good thing we've started doing is straight out asking the patients, what are we doing that makes you feel welcome? Beautiful, perfect. What can we do better? Is there anything offensive at our clinic to your identity, ethnicity, et cetera? How can we do better to make you in this community feel welcomed? I mean, that is chef's kiss. Beautiful. Oh, I'm so glad that the 15% concept feels helpful. Yeah, we get stuck in this idea that it has to be perfect. No, it doesn't. Who says that? Nothing's got to be perfect. We were here to mess up. We are here to try and dance and trip and fail extravagantly and step on other people's toes and then go, oh my goodness, I'm so sorry. And then to try not to do it again. We cannot make it through this life without ruptures. It's our work to repair it. Yeah. So I'd love to, I love anything that gives me more courage to be innovative. I'm glad that resonated. And yet the more that you do anything to ask people straight up, like, what do you want? What do you need? That is called deferring to the people that are most impacted and letting them guide this, guide the work of improvement. Um, best in decision-making roles, better yet, if they are compensated and get the prestige of those decision-making roles such and best possible if we um, can entirely transform in collaboration how people are included or excluded so that it doesn't follow historical patterns or rather that no one's excluded perhaps. I don't see any more questions. Do you see any on your end, Abra? I do not. Okay, uh, great. I think I can now share my screen, so I'm gonna try and do that. 